Well, hello everyone. Again, my name is Kelly Corsi Gray and welcome to the Art of Photography lesson number three. I hope you'll enjoy this lesson and if you do, please share these with your friends. So remember, Photography is all about light. And that's one of the things I will always remind you of because you're not taking a picture of something, you're taking a picture of light falling on something. And the more that kind of migrates into your brain and into your consciousness whenever you're behind a camera or your cell phone camera, the better your photography will be. Now, light is not the only thing that makes up your image. There's also the moment or a subject, as well as the composition, how you organize the actual image. And as we go through these various lessons, we'll be talking about all sorts of topics related to all three of these parts of a photograph. So if you take a look at the picture that is now showing on the screen, the question on the top of my slide is, what is this a picture of? It's very difficult to make out what it is a picture of. It's a jumble of green. There's a little bit of purple, but that's out of focus. What is it a picture of? Well, it's hard to tell because we haven't really separated the thing we want to focus on. We've used the camera, the camera has taken an image, but it hasn't shown us what we saw. So we have to take control of the camera or the camera device, the cell phone, whatever it is, and illustrate what you saw to your audience. Now it happens that there is a spider in this photograph. So if you're arachnophobic, I'm very sorry, but here, let's get a little closer. Now on the left, you can see a bit closer into the spider and then finally on the right, you can see the spider and its web full fledged. It's a big spider. This was taken down in the South Pacific Islands. I took it with a macro lens and it, uh, I certainly am not a huge fan fan of spiders, but I thought this one was really quite beautiful. So we started with this and it's a jumble, it's a mess, but we have to isolate our subject. If we isolate our subject and get close to that object, now you don't have to get physically close if you have a good zoom on your camera. Cell phone cameras don't necessarily have the best zooms their optical zoom is pretty minimal, and I'll discuss the differences between digital and optical zooms another day. But for now, now we know that I took a picture of this very, very large, scary, but attractive spider. So one of the things I wanna show you today is something that you can do with your phone camera. And I want you to find on your phone where this might happen. Now, I'm currently using an iPhone and I've put screenshots of my phone on the screen for you. So on the left, I'm clicking into the camera and that will bring me up to my box, which allows me to do different things with my camera. And down along the bottom, there are a bunch of words. It says photo, video, portrait, square, and then it says pano. So I've circled pano on the center image on my slide here. And then I've also circled the arrow up above because you can take a panoramic from either direction and you can also take them up and down. So a lot of people do a horizontal pan panorama but a lot of people forget that you can also do vertical panoramas and they're both a lot of fun. So I wanna show you some images so you can see how this comes out. So I was recently asked to be a speaker on a ship and when I was on that ship, we sailed down in the South Pacific and we were in 
a beautiful little place called Numea. It's in New Caledonia. And what I did here is I took my phone and I hit the pano button and then I scrolled the whole way across nice and slowly. And your phone will typically have directions for you if you're going too fast. And I got a beautiful scene of the beach. Now it does warp some things, but those effects can be a little fun as well. Here's another beach scene from the South Pacific. You can see it was a, a pretty rainy day. It wasn't a good day to get into the water there, but it was stunning nonetheless. Now I took some panos at the aquarium and I thought these were really fun because they had these huge, huge tanks of fish. And you have to be relatively quick, otherwise you get some strange, really long fish as you do it. Um, but you can try panoramas just about anywhere. And like everything else, I recommend that you take many pictures because you won't always get exactly what you want on the first try. And the more photos you have, the more you have to choose from. So here you can see, I did a series of vertical panoramic photos. Now on the left, I was out taking images and it was a snowy day and I said, oh, you know, this is perfect time to try a vertical panorama. And so I gave it a go uh, a few times and that's one of my efforts. We were in the South Pacific and I said, oh, you know, it'd be really cool to get the palm tree and then I took the phone the whole way down and I made sure to get my feet in it for some context. Now, one of the things you'll notice with the vertical panorama is there is some distortion, but that can be a lot of fun. So just give it a go and try not only the horizontal, do it from the left to the right, do it from the right to the left, but you can also go from top to bottom or bottom to top. This is a pretty one from the ship and it was a beautiful day and we were not allowed to get off the ship right away. So we had to wait a bit and I thought, oh, I will take a panorama. Now, another thing that you can do with panorama, and unfortunately, I don't have great examples of this, but you can, you can go from side to side and you could have someone sitting on one side of your panorama. If they ran around behind you and you did it nice and slow, you could put them also on the other side of your panorama. So um, right now I'm locked in the house with the COVID-19 pandemic. And so I don't have a lot of willing subjects to run around and appear in my photo. So I'm showing you images that I've taken previously. And here, um, my friend and I put our feet in to show we were at the beach and you can see some fun vertical panoramas. Few more from the South Pacific. One was this garden and uh, elongated pictures, really quite stunning. And they go very nicely at the top of your bar in Facebook. You can put a really nice uh, horizontal panoramic in that space. And uh, they also, of course, make good website headers for those of you who have a lot of fun with this. So I really recommend giving this a try. This is one of my favorites. I was in Glacier Bay National Park and the sun was setting and I was under the pier and the light was beautiful and the reflections were coming out. You can see the moon off to the left and my boat off to the right. And it was just such a beautiful night. And this just reminds me of a very, very beautiful place. And I, I think this one turned out pretty nicely. So I really recommend that you give this a go and uh, doesn't cost anything, doesn't hurt anyone go out and give it a try. Maybe get your favorite tree or go out in your yard. You can do the front of your house. You can do your car. Anything that is longer than uh, a typical photograph would take makes a great panoramic subject. Do think of where you put the horizon line. You'll notice that I put the horizon line here in the top third. And so I am very conscious of that. And that's why I like to have the grid lines 
on my phone. It reminds me, especially when I'm doing panoramics, um, how to line up my horizon. These are a couple from the Phipps Conservatory. I went to their holiday show and uh, I thought this was really quite spectacular. This is the fall show and you can kind of see that there's a lot of distortion if you've ever been to this particular place, but I think the photographs are really, really fun and uh, very colorful and reminds me of the good old days when you could go to exciting places outside of your home. <laughs> and this is uh, the holiday show. So I have a lot to talk about when it comes to photography, but I wanna focus on just a few things on each lesson so that you can kind of take this and spend a little time outside or inside and try these things. So give it a shot and then you can post your images on the Southern Alleghenies Museum of Art Ligonier webpage where this was uh, put up initially. Um, or you can email me and I can assist you with any questions that you might have. So today I wanna to talk a little bit about shutter speed. For those of you who have DSLR or mirrorless cameras, then you probably have already heard of shutter speed. But uh, for a lot of people who just use their phones as their cameras, this is probably not something that you've thought a lot about or have um, really put a lot of time or energy into. So I want to uh, demystify this a little bit for you. And on my chart, you can see aperture is the top band and then shutter speed is in the middle and then there's ISO on the bottom. By the time I'm finished with my lessons, we will have addressed all of these um, probably a couple times. But today, I just wanna spend a couple minutes on shutter speed. The longer the shutter speed, so a half of a second is the longest one illustrated on my visual right here. The longer the shutter speed, the more time your camera is taking the picture, the more time the aperture is open. And thus, if you're photographing a moving subject, you get a blur. At a 15th of the second, it's a little less blurred, but there's still blur. At a 125th, you've almost stopped the subject but if you are shooting something and you want something crisp and clear, then you would put it on 500th of a second or a thousandth of a second. And that's why if you're trying to get crisp animal shots, if you're out photographing wildlife and you have a camera and it has a dial, you can put it on the running man. So the shutter speed is uh, illustrating what kind of image you can get. So let me show you this visually because this is a concept that it takes a little getting used to. Now here, I've taken a picture and this happens to be in Iceland, but it could have been absolutely anywhere. And I used a fast shutter speed to freeze the wave as it splashed over the rock. And so it's a freeze frame. So this is probably a 500th of a second, a thousandth of a second. It's a fast shutter speed so that I get the, the wave, but the actual instant and it's frozen in time. Here, this has a little longer of a shutter speed. So it's still a frozen moment but you can see a little bit of dripping, let's say, on the right side of the image, a little softness where it, a little extra time made that water a little more animated. This is a freeze frame moment of getting the, the action of the waves against this rock, and you can see the moment, whereas here, you can distinctly see that there is a smooth and frothiness, a, a smooth factor to the ocean. It looks like 
icing being spread. This is a long exposure of waves hitting that same rock. Now on the beach, this is a great place to play with shutter speed. And if you've ever gone to a beach or you've ever looked at a photographer's images that they specialize in beaches, you will see that they've everybody likes to take rocks on the beach, the wave hits the rocks and then recedes back and you get some beautiful blurring of the water. Now this was probably multiple seconds. So in this instance, I had a camera on a tripod and this is a very long exposure. This is a little less long of an exposure, but the key here is the wave is going out. And so it's a little less jumbled. It's starting to be a little bit more milky and it's a pretty pleasant type of image. This is probably one of my favorites of the series because here you can see the wave has receded, but you can see the motion of the ocean. You can see some details on the sand and of the rocks, um, but you can see that the water is in movement. This one as well, you're getting even more movement and more detail and which picture you choose after you've shot a series of these is purely up to your particular taste. But here you get the sense of the movement of the wave and perhaps there's another wave coming in, but you can see that the water has receded and it's this beautiful flowing type of uh, image of the water. And here is uh, even a little bit more. So a whole series of images now here, this is a freeze frame. So this is a fast exposure of the image. And here, this is an exposure, but this is probably in the 30th of a second or the 15th of a second, because if you look in the exact, um, well, the top third of the image and the waves in the center, you can see some blur of those waves. So this is a, an image that is primarily sharp, but you can see a bit of the movement of the water. And here again, there's a teeny bit of movement in the water. So this was captured at probably a 30th of a second, if I had to guess. Now, a lot of you are saying, well, I don't have a camera like that and I don't have a tripod. I don't have a camera. How could I get pictures that show that lovely blur of the water or use motion? And you can do it with your cell phone as well. So I did show these images before, but I want to show you again. I clicked into my camera and I shot a picture with the live feature. So I've circled that. It's up in purple in the top left hand corner of the slide. And then over on the right, after you've shot an image, you take your finger and you swipe up. So you take from the bottom of the screen or the bottom of the image and you just swipe up and then you get a choice of different effects that you can use. So you can just have the live photo or you can loop the photo into a small video. You can bounce the photo or you can do the long exposure. Now the long exposure imitates what it would be like if you had a big old camera that you had sitting on a tripod and you press that exposure button and expose this stream for a few seconds. So on the left is the image. Now that's a live image, but I just took the, the one frame of that image and what the live image does is it fuses multiple images together, thus giving you the appearance of a slow shutter speed photograph. So even with your cell phone, you can do amazing things these days. Now, again, I was personally using an iPhone with this, but I know that there are incredibly wondrous cameras that are non-iPhone uh, that have all of these features as well. 
So where else might you like to see motion? Well, in this instance, I was photographing the snow geese in Middle Creek, Pennsylvania. In Middle Creek, somewhere between February and March, somewhere between, I don't know, 50 and 100 plus thousand snow geese come to this particular uh, pond, lake area. They spend the day in the cornfields eating and uh, it's an amazing spectacle. And in this instance, rather than trying to get each bird crisply, I had lots of pictures where I had my shutter speed set to a 500th of a second or a thousandth of a second. I decided to go with the slower shutter speed to get the motion of the birds and to give you the feeling that you too were standing under this incredible flock of snow geese as they started to take off. Now, this is an image that I took on a walk. I love to go for walks around my home and I live in a, a wonderfully beautiful rural part of Western Pennsylvania. And as I was walking by this field, I thought, huh, this might be interesting to try a bit of a longer exposure. And I was hand holding my camera, so I just experimented. I probably took 50 to 100 pictures of the weeds blowing in the wind, and I thought it was kind of a fun effect. So you can see that the, um, the little, uh, milkweed pods on the right of the image are in focus. They didn't really blow around as much as kind of the leafy grass that was on the left side of the screen, but it just gives a little oomph to your photograph. And if you look at pictures in National Geographic and some of the other big photo publish, uh, photo magazines that, uh, that are very, very professional in their photographs, very often there's a tinge of movement in those images. So take a look. Now here I was attending a cultural show, again in the South Pacific, and this is on the island of Tonga. And this performer was dancing and I decided after getting some crisp, clear images, I would like to try to get a little bit of blur to show that he was actually dancing and moving. And so I took images and you can see his hands, especially the hand closest to me, was a little blurred in both of these images. So that's it for today. This is your assignment number three. Um, today we spoke about, of course, we mentioned light. And then I started by telling you about some panoramas that you can take with your cell phone. So I want you to try it. I want you to go outside or you can try it inside. You can even use your friends as props and try taking a horizontal and a vertical panorama. And if you get one that you like, do post it to the SAMA webpage where you perhaps clicked on this video and um, I can uh, give you some comments. Also, if you have the opportunity, take a live photograph of something and do something with a little bit of photo blur. Give it a go, give it a try. It doesn't hurt anything. Nobody is going to tell you you took a bad photograph. You, you can and will take plenty of bad photographs, but the more you take, the more you learn and the better you get at photography. So hopefully these assignments and lessons are fun and you are learning something. I really enjoy telling you about photography and I hope that you will come back and watch The Art of Photography number four. So my name is Kelly Corsi Gray and I'm working with the Southern Alleghenies Museum of Art in Ligonier, PA. And eventually we would like to have classes on land back when the world reopens and you can come in and talk with me personally, but feel free to post images on the SAMA website or you can find me on Facebook and email or message me as well. So if you had fun, please come back for number four and share this with your friends. 
My name's Kelly. See you next time.